I get people to take their seats? <laughs> Jules is making a mess. <laughs> we good? So thank you. I hope you had a fantastic lunch. Uh, I, I was delighted to be able to look out over the crowd and realize that lots of people who I know didn't know each other were talking to one another, which just makes me sort of all happy. Um, so hopefully it was you know, well worth the conversation. Um, I'm excited to have everyone back from lunch. We're going to have a few more fire starters to get our sort of ideas going. And then we're going to switch to more of a moderated conversation about what's been raised so far before we switch into workshops. So first up for uh, causing trouble and fire starting things is Kevin Bankson. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, let's start some fires, shall we? Um, when considering the future of big data and privacy, we must consider the biggest data of all. The data set that encompasses almost all the others, the data that transits the internet. As our offline activities and records move online, our shopping, our consumption of news and entertainment, our financial and legal and medical records and transactions, and an ever-increasing number of personal and business communications of every kind, even the most sensitive. The depth and breadth of this massive data set continues to expand. As all roads once led to Rome, nearly all data streams today eventually flow into and through the great river of data that is the internet. Therefore, when considering the ethics of big data and privacy, it's necessary to look to the ISPs and governments, including our own, that have access to that river of data, often subject to unclear or insufficient legal protections. What are the duties that these stewards of cyberspace owe to us? Would it be ethical, for example, for an ISP to secretly monitor and record everything you're reading and searching for so it could better serve you targeted ads or sell that information to a data broker? What if it gave you notice? or even a discount on your service in exchange for permission? And what are the government? Would it be right for our government to secretly install massive automated surveillance stations on top of major internet exchange points inside of the United States, vacuuming up all of our data under questionable legal authorities and filtering for suspicious identifiers and patterns? Would it be right for our government to secretly tap into the fiber lines that link the data centers of US companies whose services are used by masses of innocents both here and abroad? These questions are not hypothetical. Um, and the ultimate report of the Big Data Working Group will be incomplete if it does not at least attempt to address some of these questions. And there are three answers to these questions that I hope we'll eventually see. The first answer to these questions is transparency. Whether talking about ISPs or governments, tapping the internet backbone shouldn't occur without the knowledge and consent of us, the customers and the governed. That is why I hope that the administration soon will finally admit to a fact that's been on the front pages of every major newspaper since December 2005. That's been evidenced by whistleblower documents leaked from inside of AT&T and the government that's implicit but obvious in FISA court opinions and procedures that are now declassified and has even been, I think, somewhat inadvertently admitted to by Dianne Feinstein. Um, <laughs> for us to have a meaningful debate in the public square, in Congress and in the courts, the administration must declassify the open secret that everyone already knows. The NSA is tapping the internet backbone inside of the United States. The second answer to these tough questions is encryption. Much of the big data discussion has focused on the risks to data in storage and on the anonymization uh, and encryption tech that might protect that data. But we also must focus on encryption for data in transit, be it encryption uh, that protects data sent between me and you, or uh, between me and your website, or between our email providers' email servers, or between Google and Yahoo's data centers. When it comes to protecting our digital privacy, code is law. And encryption is one of the strongest laws we have on the books so long as we use it. Therefore, I urge this working group to conclude, as the President's NSA Review Group also did, that the US government should strongly support, rather than undermine, the widespread use of encryption technology, not only for data at rest, but also in transit. 
A third and final answer to the problem of privacy when it comes to this biggest data set of all is the much needed reevaluation of the distinction between communications content and non-content or addressing or metadata about those communications. Where content has long been considered much more sensitive and therefore non-content has been accorded little legal protection. As Danny Weitzner, the convener of the last of these workshops, uh, testified to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, metadata at scale is at least as revealing as content. And particularly in the internet context, metadata can provide an intensely revealing portrait of one's private life, including, as Mr. Podesta noted, uh, revealing facts or patterns of behavior that would never be revealed in the content of a communication, and in many cases may not even be known to the person doing the communicating. Countless legal and technical experts, including Justice Sotomayor, the Oversight Board, the Review Group, have called into question the continued validity of this distinction between content and metadata. And the Review Group specifically recommended that the government commission a study interrogating this distinction. So I hope that this working group will be a first step in such a study. I hope that this working group will highlight the importance of an encrypted internet to the future of privacy and security. And I hope that this working group will be a force for greater transparency around how our data is collected and used, whether by ISPs or by our national security agency. Thank you. Uh, next up, Alessandro. So good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm an economist by training, so perhaps you may expect me to uh, be here to extol the benefits of big data and how big data will bring a economic win-win for data subjects and data holders alike. In fact, I'm probably more interested in the, the other side of the debate, uh, the growing concerns which seem to be rising in different, from different corners about the risk of big data. Um, data being misused, uh, inferences being correct, algorithms embody hidden value judgments by the coders, the programmers, the organizations which write those algorithms. However, I do remain an economist, so I'll try to build my argument, or at least my analysis, in the most uh, economic-oriented manner, which means I will completely ignore the issue of privacy as a fundamental moral right. I uh, will avoid the issue of privacy as value per se, not because I don't believe those things are important, uh, I do believe they're important, but because I want to stick to good old fashioned neoclassical economics, the kind of economics that we teach to our students in undergrad and graduate classes, the kind of economics we use to study our market-based economies. And in fact, I will even assume that, hey, there is, because as economists we can assume a lot, so data will always be used efficiently, inferences will always be correct, uh, algorithms are objective, whatever that can mean. What does the economics field tell us about big data? Well, there is not much research yet, per se, in economics of big data, also because the, the term is so ambiguous, but there has been, for over 35 years, research on the economics of privacy, which is kind of like, the, 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 the other side of the coin, right? How markets work when information about consumers is being shared or not being shared. Now, the, the seminal contribution, the groundbreaking contributions in this field were from the late 1970s, early 1980s. Chicago School economists like Stigler and Posner were the first to write about economics and privacy. And they pointed out that, by and large, privacy reduces economic inefficiency. It's uh, redistributive and uh, creates frictions. However, if you stop there, it would be like uh, when students in my class stop at Econ 101 uh, after having studied perfect competition and they go home thinking that perfect competition is the only market there is, and then they study oligopolies, monopolies, market failures, because uh, much more research in the last uh, 35 years or so has shown that actually it can also be the lack of privacy which creates uh, significant economic inefficiencies. Uh, not only that, the lack of privacy can be extremely redistributive, not just across data subjects, but from data subjects to data holders. Uh, in fact, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm fighting with one hand tied behind my back, so I'm just using traditional standard new classical economics. None of these papers uses privacy as a value per se. They all focus on market efficiency. Uh, empirical studies on privacy show both that privacy and privacy protection, for instance, re regulatory protection, can reduce innovation and economic growth or can increase innovation and economic growth. 
I have some citations and references at the bottom. Happy to expand offline if you're interested. So you may interpret this in a negative sense, such as, OK, economists are indecided. They answer every question, kind of like law scholars do with, it depends, right? But in fact, there is a lesson here, because the lesson is that we are not even yet able to answer pretty crucial questions, such as, will big data increase the economic pie, or will it simply change the allocation of the pie, which I find it uh, incredibly important question to address. Let me give a specific, specific, specific example, bringing back to my interest as economists. Take targeted advertising. There are two ways of framing the debate, and you know how you frame the debate will impact how people will think about it. One way is that, well, we have consumers who, who want to buy goods, and they have search costs to find the goods they want. There are merchants who want to sell the goods to the consumers, and they have search costs in finding those consumers. And uh, the data industry in between produces a win-win because it reduces the cost of both sides by facilitating the matching of merchant and consumers, right? That's one frame. Another frame is this, that consumers as a whole are being studied. And therefore, we can understand their willingness to pay for each good. We can also understand how to influence and nudge their behavior in one direction rather than the other. Merchants as a whole are competing aggressively for a finite resource, which is consumer attention. The data holders in between they are the oligopoly, which is the gatekeeper between uh, two entities competing aggressively for uh, the attention. So in this case, uh, the data holders are no longer presented as uh, reducing search costs, are presented as uh, extracting surplus from both sides of the equation. So I'm not taking sides, I'm just presenting both frames, pointing out that we want to believe that there will be, there will be balancing forces leading us to an optimal equilibrium, but in fact, we don't know much about how these balances forces will work. In fact, we don't know whether market competition will be enough to uh, control the power which comes associated with uh, um, um, information, the economies of scope and scale which lead naturally to oligopolies uh, in this area. We also rely a lot on transparency and control, right? On consumer responsabilization. So uh, transparency is important, it's absolutely crucial. Control is important, it's crucial as well. The problem, begins when we interpret transparency and control as uh, sufficient conditions rather than necessary conditions. What I'm pointing out is a significant body of research which shows the incredible limitation of both control and transparency in really helping consumer behavior. And therefore, to finalize, the myth is that let to left to its own devices, big data will guarantee an economic win-win. I'm pretty sure that we cannot guarantee that. The facts are that, that, in fact, big data can be extremely redistributive. And uh, no guarantee that market forces alone, transparency and control mechanisms alone, or data ownership mechanisms alone, will achieve an equilibrium where the surplus coming from users' data is uh, fairly distributed. The big unknowns are what I mentioned earlier. Is the, big growing, is the pie growing, or is the allocation changing, or both happening at the same time, and to which extent? Thank you. We have Lafania. Wow, I'm not as tall as Alessandro. Uh, <laughs> it's good to be here, and thank you for having me. Uh, I have to always start uh, by with a bunch of disclaimers. And so, um, so let me just say, I've recently been appointed to as the Chief Technology Officer at the FTC, so I'm required to let you know that anything I say in this presentation or workshop does not necessarily reflect the views of the FTC or its commissioners or are even my own views. So, <laughs> you've been notified. Um, so, transparency establishes trust. Our national security infrastructure and the largest high tech companies have found value in transparent personal data data from us to them. They trust that the quality of the personal data they receive to, to make revenue and national security decisions. But the opposite is true too. A lack of, dis, dis, uh, a lack of transparency breeds distrust. Not knowing what they do with the personal data they receive leaves the public distrustful and vulnerable. It's kind of a two-way street. Transparent sharing of data from us to the repository should have transparent data sharing from a repository. And this has been a lesson in healthcare too, and I'll use that as an example. When it comes to health data, trust begins with the doctor-patient relationship. 
Without that trust, patients will not give useful information and they may risk poor treatment. The patient needs to make his data transparent to physicians and hospitals, but what is not transparent are all the places that data may go. So we started a project that began to map all the places personal health data may go beyond the data-patient relationship. Any papers, all the, everything that I'm going to say is all documented on thedatamap.org, so feel free to visit. So here's a view of the map today. We use breach notices and FOIA requests to document flows of data sharing. If you click on a node, you'll get the actual entities that are involved. So each node represents a category of entities like companies or agencies. The line between them represent documented flows of personal health information. If the line is dashed, the information is shared without explicit identity. And if the line is solid, the explicit name of the patient is shared. You can click on the node to see the actual names of the entities. So one of the things that's interesting is most people in the United States feel that HIPAA is a very comprehensive law. One of the most amazing things to us was that more than half of the edges on the graph are not covered by HIPAA. The other thing that we found when we made data more transparent is that we could begin to document flows and we found various cycles that uh, agree with a lot of anecdotal examples. But one of the biggest sources that we found was this discharge data. These are statewide collections of patient health information that are collected under state mandates. A copy of the information from every visit to a hospital and in some states to a physician office is sent to the state and the state in turn may share or sell the data. These are examples of data that are not covered by HIPAA. And much of their data does involve these dash lines as sort of de-identified data. So who are these states? Well, 33 states not only collect the data, but they sell or share that personal health data. One of the things we found interesting is that only three of them do so in a way that adheres to HIPAA. That is, 30 of them are using standards that are weaker than HIPAA. So what, what kind of problems could that happen? Well, by, could that pose? By having more transparency in the data sharing, we took an example of this cycle here where the patient goes to the hospital, a copy of the hospital visit about that patient goes to the state, um, a financial company then purchases or acquires a copy of the discharge data and that financial company has a relationship with that patient. There was an example uh, that in the, a story appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine many years ago about a Maryland banker who got discharge data like this and crossed the information with debtors at his bank and then would treat their credit worthiness. So if a person had cancer, he would begin to call in their debt. I have no idea if that's true, and I'm not saying that the financial companies that are on the data map, if you were to click the financial link, are engaged in this kind of behavior. But it gives us an example of where to look, and one of the key questions is how identifiable in that, would that dash line be. We also sent FOIA requests to the states to find out who were the top buyers of these publicly available data sets. And one of the things we found interesting was that researchers didn't come anywhere near the top, but companies like WebMD and IMS Health and so forth did come among the top. So the question is, how vulnerable might this data be? So for $50, we purchased a copy of the health data from the state of Washington for the year 2011. It included virtually all hospitalizations that happened in the state. This is an example of some of the data uh, found in it. It includes patient demographics, diagnosis, procedures, attending physicians, summary of charges, how the bill was paid. Uh, it doesn't contain the patient's name or address, but it does contain their zip code. We also surveyed newspaper stories that were printed in the state of Washington for the same time period that contained the word hospitalized. Most news stories include a patient's names and residential information and explain why the person was hospitalized, such as a vehicle accident or an assault. So what we found was that information from the news stories uh, exactly matched medical records in these publicly available Washington state data in 43% of the cases, thereby putting names to the records. Um, and the way we did that was we basically used public records to get a zip code for the person, and then we took the combination of the news story with the zip code and linked it on the hospital ch charge data. And we looked for an exact match. So this is not statistical matching. This is just an absolute match. We gave all the results to Jordan Robertson, who is a reporter at Bloomberg News, and Bloomberg News and their editors contacted each person and found that each of our matches were correct. Um, in their story, they reported some, some of them, and they agreed that they would only report those people who were willing to go forward. 
So the reason we pick news stories, though, is this isn't about news stories. This is the same information an employer knows about an employee who takes leave from work, a creditor knows about a borrower who is late due to hospitalizations, and friends and neighbors know about patients. So this experiment quickly showed us uh, shows us the power of making data sharing transparent. It gave us a way of thinking about policy and identifying risk and harms. So what are ways to add to transparency? Well, data holders could publicly list those to whom they share the data, like we found, like we leveraged the FOIA request in the state of Maine actually does. Uh, each person could acquire a copy of their own data by request, which is a, something that HIPAA does allow for, and each person could even acquire an audit trail of places to whom their data is shared. And there's a long list and so forth, and I'm not saying all of these or any of these, I'm just using that as a way to launch a, a firestorm. Thanks. Thank you. Next, where's Deborah? That's why I was worried, Helen, where is she? Ah, uh, yeah, problem with this word, your. So thank you, I'm here uh, now in New York City at Cornell Tech, and uh, thank you for the invitation. So I want to talk about why I think it's useful to talk about small data, too. And as we've been discussing, each time someone uses their smartphone, social media, search engine, mobile game, slot machine, loyalty card, they implicitly generate digital breadcrumbs that together form this digital trace of their activities and behavior. And so just for the hell of it, because of uh, Alessandro's uh, slide, we call these things small data, which I'm sure you're equally tired of hearing. Um, as we've been talking about, these data are used to, uh, in aggregate by the digital services, by institutions to improve system performance, tailor service offerings, conduct research, and yes, target advertisements. And the reason we're here today is that these highly personalized data can be analyzed to draw powerful inferences about my health and all sorts of other behaviors. And my interest in focusing on small data is that I, these inferences can be directly useful to me as an individual. These inferences can be useful to me. They're not only useful to the Googles and Aetnas and at ts and USAs of the world. I think there is power and value uh, in those data. And they're powerful in part because things like our health conditions and our behaviors show up in our function, in our everyday behaviors. And of course, as we're discussing here for the first time really, our everyday behaviors are becoming data in a comprehensive and continuous way. So just for an example, uh, in the small data lab at Cornell Tech, we're uh, exploring applications that help a doctor and a patient figure out how a new medication or a supplement is working by creating a comparative picture of the daily function this month relative to last month before a change in dose or introduction of a new med. And it does that by automatically analyzing data that's passively uh, left behind. Uh, we're also working on apps to, uh, uh, to refer to the uh, economist in the room, I'm sure there's more than one, that tie our small data to tools for a person or a family to better manage their health or finances or time and other scarce resources, sort of a la Sandhill Melanathan's uh, our scarcity book, which I highly recommend to you. And I really see these sorts of apps as an opportunity to rebalance what John Podesta referred to earlier this morning as the fact that others can know more about me than I know about myself. These apps that we could create on top of these small data could let us know what others know and benefit from that knowledge. What an, and that's also similarly what another John in the room, uh, John Madison, uh, was calling at lunch reciprocal transparency and also what Alessandro earlier was referring to as the importance of that kind of transparency. So I just want to propose that we uh, try to do uh, four things in the interest of pursuing uh, small data. One is encourage institutions to provide personal data APIs so that individuals can programmatically opt in for access to their data. Second is to catalyze an ecosystem of apps and services to actually make those data useful to the individual by having standardized APIs and data definitions, and that's some of the work that uh, we do in the context of OpenM Health, uh, to build personal data services as a context in which individuals can engage with their data 
and selectively share uh, some of that data with transparency and control. And four is address the role of policy and law in protecting individuals from inappropriate secondary use of that data and many others more qualified have talked about that today. So just to conclude, in the future that we're building towards at Cornell Tech and OpenM Health and more broadly in this community, you would be able to opt in to access your digital traces and choose apps that privately, pr privately process, fuse, and filter that small data for you. Thank you, Deborah. And last but certainly not least, uh, Clay Shirky. I feel a little bit embarrassed to be going last because I'm not here to talk about a big problem. I'm here to talk about a little problem. Um, this is not, oh, sorry. This is not about uh, large scale algorithmic accountability. This is a piece of grit in a system that I think I've seen and that I, the problem I think might be general. I've been spending time thinking about it because it's a problem I helped create and it's a problem I can't figure out how to solve and I think there may be something here. So here it goes. Um, at, uh, hello. Forward button. Which? Yeah. I got it. Just wasn't selected. So at NYU, um, we have this issue where there are some classes that are more popular than can be filled. More students want to take the classes than the, than the class has seats. NYU's answer to that is first come, first served, uh, which has the pernicious effect of giving some students everything they want and some students nothing they want. So within my department, ITP, a group of us designed an alternate solution, which is pretty much what you'd expect. The students list their, their preferences in rank order. This procedure is universally called the algorithm among students, faculty, and staff. Uh, they list their preferences in rank order. Uh, and then those preferences are run through the algorithm, which is pretty much what you'd expect. We try to give, we select people at random out of the pool of all students. We try to give everyone their first choice. Anyone who doesn't get their first choice is given a karma chip. And for the second most popular classes, those people are selected at random first, and so on down the chain. Right. Now, you can imagine with a, uh, with a selection like this, you, you build up a fairly significant grid of student preferences. And then that grid is dumped out into a class list. However, because the student preferences are so widely variable, and because it relies so heavily on random selection, any two runs of the algorithm can lead to very different kinds of results. So we run a Monte Carlo simulation on our own population, and we generate many, many, many iterations of a large-scale class schedule until we get to a class of outcomes that all have the statistical property that students, that we are maximizing essentially the student's ability to get into one of their, one or more of their top four choices. Right. Now, if students were interchangeable widgets, this would be a perfectly reasonable solution. Students are not interchangeable widgets. So here is the issue. Imagine that the person who runs the algorithm is also a teacher, as is indeed the case. And this teacher has two students they like very much and two students that they do not like, for whatever reasons. And that all four of those students have listed that teacher's class is their number one choice. You could, with enough, with enough cycles, generate statistically identical outcomes that optimize for that teacher and that teacher only having two favorite students in that class and the two least favorite students out of that class. Now, ethically, I think this is a bad outcome. But the strange thing is it's statistically identical to the other outcomes and if it was arrived at without any interference, it would be a perfectly valid outcome. Furthermore, it's not subject to the usual modes of transparency. Right? We can see all of the data. We know how the algorithm works. It's in the Monte Carlo simulation plus the addition of private preferences that makes this uh, a, 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 a small but unobservable threat. So, to take a larger version of that same, that same problem, because once I started seeing this issue in our own institution, I don't believe the problem happens, but we're not defended against it in any significant way. I started thinking about it every place there is a sorted list. So one of the most famous sorted lists is US News and World Report's list of public colleges. And the top 10 get active scrutiny every year. And US News and World Report is relatively good about publishing their data. They've got the underlying data. 
but they make no bones about the fact that they tweak the algorithm every year, and that as a private company, they can run any iteration of the algorithm they care to. You can, as a, as a private citizen, get all the data and write your own sorting, but as Kevin Kelly told us in Triumph of the Default, right? that almost never happens. The people who set the defaults essentially set the behavior of the system with only minor changes on the outside. So what if, to take this, to, to take this Monte Carlo threat, what if there were people inside that organization who were not committed to radical alterations of the top 10, but rather making sure that Bates College never makes it into the top 20? Or that the College of, or that the college of Holy Cross always makes it into the top 25? It would be possible with very minor tweaks to ensure those outcomes without creating any statistical signature or any, any opacity in the data. So Corinne mentioned earlier ensuring fairness. And we have from Tim this idea of, of algorithmic accountability. But here the accountability isn't in the data or the algorithm. This is the thing that makes this attack odd. You can see all of both things and still not be able to detect self-dealing on the part of these organizations. So let me end with uh, a, a metaphorical observation about this class of problem. This is a picture of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jer Jerusalem. It's the most famous, uh, most famous Christian church in Jerusalem. And you might imagine, were any Christian sect to get hold of the front door of this church, that they might lock out the other sects. The Russian Orthodox would lock out the Greek Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox would lock out the Catholics, the Catholics would lock out the Protestants, and so on. The solution is that the, key, the keys to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are kept by a Muslim family because they don't have a dog in that fight. Right? And I think one of the only ways that we could get around this class of problem would be to say that when a sorting is done, especially if it involves weighted algorithms or random simulation or both, coupled with the Monte Carlo ability to generate lots and lots and lots of statistically identical outcomes, that only if it's run and the output is generated by a third party can we be relatively assured that this kind of self-dealing isn't taking place because you would have to document everything you wanted to have run. Right? It's the ability to hide private preferences inside statistically large samples that makes this, I think, the issue that it is. And I don't mean to put this up at the level of US News and World Reports taking bribes to put a college in the top 10 or take it out of the top 10. That's obviously much more significant. What I do mean to say is that there are subtle interactions when people control the data, the algorithm, and the statistical observations, because there, this is a class of problem that even transparency won't get us out of. Thank you. actually going to have a chance to go and start talking as a group. Um, and so we're going to have a group conversation in here before we go in and do a deep dive in the, in the workshops. And I guess Nicole and I want to sort of start this off. We have some questions for you, but we actually want to start by saying, where are you at? What is sort of striking you as critical issues, key points, key tensions that you need to uh, see addressed? Or what do you feel has not been uh, you know, raised so far? Are there particular perspectives that people want to throw out there? So earlier we heard about the, the notion of bonus for bytes, where uh, in order to gamble, people are having to give up information. There's just um, a myriad of analogs for that all across industry. So there's this involuntary uh, submission of our personal data that's going on in order to play in a lot of the digital world. Um, a lot of what we talk about in this space is uh, permitted uses and consent and voluntary um, and trackable consent. But ultimately, I think any solution has to address both the voluntary and involuntary sources of data. And one of the things that concerns me the most is that as more sophisticated avatars become available, and I believe that there will be avatars of every political persuasion, sponsored by every political persuasion, every religious persuasion, every multinational, because we will feed these beasts with our data voluntarily and involuntarily, and they will help be our augmented reality for interacting with the universe. And as the value proposition rises for that 
uh, value of these avatars. Um, and as we feed them both voluntarily and involuntary, uh, involuntarily, the question becomes who owns your avatar and why do you care? And so I think one of, one of the one of the things that concerns me the most is as we move more and more and more into a field of services that resemble uh, more comprehensive avatars that we both voluntarily and involuntarily feed, how do we have the reciprocal, reciprocal transparency that Deborah alluded to earlier into who owns that and what they want from me aside from providing those services that I'm willing to feed the beast with voluntarily? I think much of the conversation thus far has treated big data as this monolithic entity. And I'd like to see a little bit more discussion about uh, what are the value risk trade-offs for big data in different sectors. So, you know, does financial information need a different level of security concern, privacy, than health information, than social information, and other kinds of things? Um, the thing that probably struck me the, the single thing that probably struck me most out of this morning was uh, Latanya Sweeney's map of the um, ways that data are shared between different healthcare providers and entities. And what struck me about it was not just the fact that half of those interactions are not even covered by HIPAA, it's that there are so many interactions. And the sheer complexity, um, the number of knock-on effects that are generated by a piece of data being created and being made available from one person to another is so vast that it kind of raises for me a desperate question, which is, well, can we do anything? Um, in, when there is, when the, when the, the knock-on effects are so, so multiple and so unpredictable, what sorts of things, what sorts of measures can guard against the unintended consequences? Um, and that's a sort of, that's a very, it's a kind of a desperate question, it's a very general question as well. It's, you know, do things like reciprocal transparency have this kind of all-round viral effect that prevents, prevents bad things happening? Um, Anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to throw out. So I, I'm concerned about something that Nuala touched on, but I think we haven't otherwise talked about, which is in particular free speech and privacy and other civil liberties and how we, if at all, treat those differently. Um, how, sh how should we think about preference engines that, uh, that, that predict what we will like, uh, that, that don't expose us to things that, that uh, maybe would cause us to change our mind? Um, what should we do about... Uh, uh, algorithms that select people for differential treatment based upon their reading habits or their political views, views or their web surfing. In a sense, we have that with behavioral advertising, but we're so used to thinking about that in terms of an economic transaction um, and where we tend to privilege efficiency um, rather than diversity and pluralism. And I think that's what I'm most concerned about and how we fix it, whether it is through law, uh, corporate boards of ethics, um, uh, code, or, or other, other forms of uh, regulation or, or nudging that we haven't yet thought of. One issue that I would like to see talked about a little bit more is how do you draw the distinction between personal, personalization and, say, personalized services where users may set some basic preferences but then some inferences may be drawn versus a scenario that you just outlined and that's where there might be differential treatment without any kind of consumer knowledge that that is taking place in the background. Sure. One of the things that I'm interested in discussing that I think I started to see also in Latanya Sweeney's uh, has to do with the long livedness of data and the data trajectories that are potentially uh, potentially not anticipated by users. So we tend to think about big data a lot as in the here and now, but it's also in a regulatory and political and industrial landscape that's constantly shifting. And the organizations that we currently trust to give data to, that data may move, it may migrate. And that could be the question of WhatsApp being, you know, bought by Facebook or you know, companies getting acquired, which uh, small businesses, uh, small startups all over the place are actively seeking opportunities to be acquired. That means they've made it. That means they have success. Um, they may sell off their user databases in order to do that. Or it may be the question of people taking to the streets and uh, coordinating their activities on Twitter for a revolution that two years later turns out another party is in power and that data gets trolled and those people are tracked down. So I think one of the things we need to consider is the kind of long now of the data infrastructures that we have and the, the data trajectories and long lifetimes that extend into futures that are perhaps uh, difficult for us to comprehend. Hi, Jules Polonitsky. So one of the challenges I think that um, we face as we look at this is that there are clearly benefits that most of us would recognize and say those are benefits to, to society or to people and there are clearly risks that are already legally risks or that seem quite odious. But there are a whole bunch of other benefits that we, we the, the world, 
doesn't necessarily agree our benefits. And then there are a whole bunch of risks that maybe are um, theoretical risks or inchoate risks or some of us think are risks and others think that they're not risks. And so as we go ahead and sort of grapple with how to balance or how to resolve, um, we're dealing with the fact that we may not actually agree or have consensus about the risk or how serious it is or how likely it is to happen. Um, and we're asking for trade-offs when we also don't agree uh, with the value other than uh, on the, air, you know, the, the areas at each extreme where there is consensus. And so how one might um, set up processes that identify and say, here, society has got to agree. Do we care about protecting this class that never was legally protected before, but now it seems that there's some greater risk to these people because of big data uh, or vice versa? Are there some benefits that let us say, sorry, we're going to impact this class because we're solving these problems? And if we don't have the, the – we're not even debating sort of the same quid pro quos, and we need to figure out how to do that. One of the things that I'm finding a little bit complex right now is that we're not problematizing much um, the concept of privacy. We're sort of assuming that we know what it is and we're assuming that it's a kind of universal, standard, um, unchanging entity in the world. Whereas in fact, p privacy is changing and always changes with new infrastructure, with new technology. So understanding that you know, inevitable social change has to be part of the policy discourse. Um, Anne Washington, um, I know that there is at least one other person trained as a librarian in the room. Uh, there have been many centuries that people have dealt with new data, what's going to happen, how do we share it, from King John recording everybody who existed in his new territory that he acquired. So there's a lot of historic uh, theory that we could look at, both for librarians and information science. Um, there are lots of people who do teach information science here as well. And thinking about how they've been thinking about it, uh, what's available, their rec ma records management policies for these hospitals, there are lots of little pockets where we could impact this. And there are a lot of data librarians available who might be in your institutions who might be able to help you think through some of these things, and I just wanted to mention that as a resource. <laughs> so, um, yes, as perhaps the other librarian in the room. I just wanted to um, say I hope that we also talk about uh, learning spaces and how people educate themselves and each other about um, online behavior and use of these various tools. I mean, as a public librarian, I know that our buildings are learning venues for some people. Um, we've also talked about trust today and the way that people come to, to learn has to do with the trust networks they have. And so, again, just talking about who, um, who are the educators in these various chains we're talking about and how do we educate. I want to build on what uh, Anne and Alex Howard talked about earlier in saying that a lot of this is trendy but not necessarily new. And I'm always frustrated when I hear big data conversations without the word statistics. Because of course statisticians have been grappling with a lot of these thoughts for a long time. It's just that now instead of having to be accredited and get the data yourself, any of us can download the census and build a model and just run it and put it on our blogs quite easily. So I think I'm preempting my session. So for those of you who aren't in it, uh, I'm excited to talk about the responsibility between those of us creating the statistical models and the public to interpret those or at least be able to ask questions about them and what went into the decisions we made. Uh, so I'm one of those people who build these tyrannical algorithms. And I'd like just to, to, to see in part of our conversation also uh, discussing some of the positive aspects of, of these systems because they actually make our lives better in many ways, right? So uh, just put, put that out there. And the other thing that I think is a problem, um, I hear lots of rhetoric around like ensuring fairness and automated decision, uh, protect people from inaccurate data. But as somebody who's building these systems, I have no idea how to translate that. What does that mean? How does that affect like, the things that I am building? I have no idea. So how do we work on translating between sort of the legal, ethical framework to the engineering? Uh, uh, partly just reacting to Gilad, I think that one of the other pieces of the framework we need to bring in is that a lot of this is not because of a change in the legal or ethical environment. 
it's a collapse of inconvenience, that a lot of what kept our data from being collected and reused was that it was really inconvenient to do so. So in a way, what we're, what we're looking at now is without inconvenience as a backstop, what it, so we're, I think we're finding legal and ethical patches for this collapse of inconvenience. And I think we should take into account the places where what's possible has expanded so dramatically to, to your last point about, about good and bad, and not just look at it as if, not just look at it as two legal and ethical frameworks, but as a, a legal and ethical framework that's trying to now do the job that, that, that used to be done just by sheer difficulty of collection and reuse. Um, Alex McGillary, I'll, I'll uh, Clay kind of took part of it, so I'll just underline something he said, which is to say that these are not things that operate outside of context. They're uh, things that operate within the context. And so it's the, the answer, the, the, the alternative is not necessarily that Clay would not choose any people for his classes, um, but that he would do it manually, which might be a much more uh, susceptible to, to problems like that. The other thing I would push us to consider is um, we'll set up, we're, a lot of us are rule people, I'm a lawyer, um, so we'll set up some rules, but we should be thinking about what happens when those break down, what happens when people abuse them. So it's, it's all fine and good to have principles about how to do this right, but what do we, ha what do, we do when we do when parts of those fall down? Um, I, I want to do... Uh, <coughs> I've heard this notion of transparency mentioned in several of the comments and I'm very much affected by the picture that I'd seen before but that Latanya uh, showed us because I actually think that this, that picture, while it's incredibly valuable for someone, is not, it shows why transparency is not going to be the answer for those of us as individuals who are the data subjects, because as we can see, when we look at that uh, picture and the complexity of the data flows, and I'm sure that it's, this exists in many different environments, we freak out and we say, well, 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 what are we gonna do about it and why and how and so on? So I think that when I think about transparency and it's been an answer, you know, Alessandra mentioned uh, notice and consent and so forth, I'm dubious. It's not to say that transparency isn't useful for some actors and for some purposes, but I just don't see that it can be the answer for individual decision makers as they confront the opportunities to provide information in different circumstances. And, and, and failing that, the question is, well, what can we do that would serve us better? So one of the things that it's been sticking with me, this kind of onrush of news reports about all the data being generated, is uh, what happens when a lot more of the space we move around in uh, has sensors embedded into it. And I refer to this in the presentation a bit, but if you're tracking the news around this, you hear smart thrown around a lot. And what that usually means is something, it now has an IP address and it's connected to the internet. And if you connect a sensor to that, then it's generating some data. Now, what's interesting is smart lights, smart meters, smart street lamps, whatever, are now being uh, put into lots of cities. And it, you know, as processing and storage costs you know, plummet, that means the uh, cost of acquiring data from them is also going down a lot too, which means that people's movements that can now be monitored in significant ways. And so the thing I'm wondering about, uh, I, I hear from, from tech folks and have been hearing for years that we're gonna, collection is inevitable and we're just gonna have more and more data collection, so let's talk about usage in terms of harms. But it, you know, in this context, should we be talking about whether these systems for collection should be put in or not? You know, are communities being given the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't want my local airport to have the LED lights that track people's movements put in. Um, because there's lots of other contexts where communities get to say, uh, we don't want these, these cameras to have gone in. You know, the closed circuit cameras have been around for decades now. And, and if you go to the inner cities, you know, there's lots of opinions about whether they're good or not, but they're there. My thinking is if the next generation of lights and infrastructure all has motion detection with data capture, we're gonna be in a very different world very quickly. And I'm not sure that there's really effective public notice and disclosure about that infrastructure going in. It's just kind of there. And then the New York Times says, hey, New York Airport's got the stuff now. Heads up. And if we're having a policy discussion on the law side, the media side, academic side, um, should there be an opportunity to go around to every community and say, do you want this stuff? Here's the possible benefits. You could save 35% on your energy. You could get to work this much faster because there's this really strong efficiency argument, economic argument. 
but what do you lose on the other side? And I don't see those public discussions going on. I just see afterwards the news report and then the oh my God. So the um, word that I'm thinking about is literacy. And technology has always framed what it means to be literate. And we're now with, um, we seriously have to consider what it means to be data literate. Um, and as it means from transparency, your ability to understand those graphs, graphs has a lot to do with um, how literate you are. And so thinking about even if we can create all these APIs and all these tools that allow you to take in, you still have to be able to make sense of it. Um, and so I'm struck about how much work we need to do um, and how long it's going to take such that we have a population that is literate to be able to understand which avatar they want to take that represents them because they understand the algorithms and things that are underneath it. Uh, I just want to pick up the transparency thread from Latanya, Helen, uh, Deborah contributed to it. Uh, and make one technical point and one historical point. I, I take Latanya's uh, graph uh, as a problem statement, not a solution statement. Uh, and I think it's really, and Helen, exactly to your point, I, I think it would be criminal if we expected uh, healthcare uh, uh, users of the healthcare system or any other kind of system to look at something like that, which is actually probably simplified. Uh, if you could probably go out a few more dimensions and make it much more complex. And by the way, that's a regulated area. So uh, in the areas that we seem to worry about more that may be unregulated, probably a lot more complicated. Um, uh, and so I just take Latanya's statement, graph, as a, as a challenge to computer scientists, system designers, others to say, how do we actually make that data useful? That's what, that's what systems people are good at. I think Deborah has kind of an example of how that might start to happen by giving people actual access to that data. But that, I, I do think there's a, a kind of a missing discussion here about what law traditionally does. Uh, what law, whether it's law regulation 1.0 or 2.0 in Nick's model, um, uh, you know, law handles the transaction cost associated with everyone making their own private agreements to satisfy their own uh, 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 needs. Uh, um, we don't expect people to go negotiate every single relationship they're in, whether it's healthcare or anything else. Uh, uh, we, we sometimes say there are certain social goods and we want to accomplish them and we're we decide in a relatively centralized regulation 1.0 kind of way that these are important. And um, so to me the question is how do, you, how do you combine what I think is certainly a, a huge wealth of creativity in being able to reduce complex data structures to things that are understandable but also recognize that that, that will in some ways only act to support uh, a set of social values, some of which we're going to actually have to make decisions about in law. And the final historical point I would make is that we actually had this discussion in the United States in the early 1970s when mainframe computers kind of became things that commercial entities could use outside of just government. And it resulted in things like the Fair Credit Reporting Act and uh, other, other, other laws about helping uh, to make sure the data was used in ways that were fair to individuals. And What's interesting about that period of time, it was also a, we were also at roughly the same time having a debate about uh, Watergate and uh, COINTELPRO and enacted FISA, and you know I think we're probably at a somewhat similar historical moment where there is a real worry about what large institutions are able to do with data processing capability. Um, the, the the IBM 360 looked just as scary to people in 1970 as, uh, you know, a big Hadoop cluster looks to people today. And so we just have to, I think, recognize the combination of, of you know, thoughtful technical analysis and, and uh, kind of legal and policy debate that got us to a point that people felt comfortable living in that world that was created in, uh, uh, in the 1970s. I'd like to associate myself with the uh, remarks of the Right Honorable Danny Weitzner. Uh, just previously made. Um, so at the risk of putting a bu bunch of us out of business, it seems to me that we have um, gone down the rabbit hole and chased the wrong rabbit. Uh, we've seen computers and tablets and data, and we therefore assume that privacy is the frame under which we should be thinking about these problems. And it seems to me that that's erroneous and likely to lead us to a, a series of uh, 
wrongful uh, considerations of, of what to do next. The better questions, I think, are, are we talking about individual benefit or ind individual burden? And are we talking about communal benefit and communal burden enough? And I think if we step back and look at it in that sort of frame and get away from the bits and bytes aspect of how we got the data, but, and rather what we're going to do with it, I think we'll reach the conclusions that Danny was talking about that happened in the 1970s where the Fair Credit Reporting Act was a response to a misuse of information. Uh, where, where we might call it privacy, but what we really mean is what decisions are we going to make as a society about what happens to individuals and what happens to our collective uh, body based on the information that's available. That's not a privacy question. That's a, it's a due process question. It's a consumer rights question. It's a consumer benefits question, um, at least to my mind. So I, I want to pick up on two points. One um, it is the sense of complexity that we saw. And I think we see that the, the complexity of these systems really defy transparency or, or consent for being meaningful in how individuals and how the society um, can address these problems. But I think it also obscures something else, which is a little bit what Tim was talking about, though I have a, a, a bit of a different <laughs> take on it. I think in many ways this is about um, power relationships. Is it commercial power, government power, or individual power that's at stake in these systems? And uh, we've had in the past, uh, I should say, um, uh, experiences with complex models using information by powerful institutions that have gone awry. We've seen it with the government recently. Um, if we think of the crash in 2008, why did that happen when well, we had very complex financial models? It just didn't work. So I have very healthy cynicism about the success of some of the, quote, big data projects. And I guess what I'd like to see a bit more discussion of is how we can think about putting systemic friction in these systems to serve as a check, um, to serve as a, you know, Where's the role of, is, the, is it the role of law to do that? Is it the role of the technology? Is it a, an ethical constraint? But where is it and how is it can we be putting a friction into the system to achieve the kind of check and balance that we've historically had that I think we've moved away from or are moving away from right now? So I have to say I'm kind of impressed that so many of us here are coming from similar perspectives. Um, I'd like to refer to the Right Honourable Dana Boyd who uh, <laughs> kicked off by asking us to think beyond the individual frame to think about communal rights and, and how we actually think about this as a shared issue. And I think this is one of the key problems when we talk about power and I'm really glad that Joel just mentioned that because I think that the power inequities now are so substantial between data gatherers and those of us who are data subjects that we actually need to start thinking about this at a completely different level than just privacy which has been conceived legally as an individual right. When you start to think about these things more as collective problems we can see that we're facing these structural power inequities that represent completely different ways of thinking. And therefore, transparency, if I get to see a dashboard to say, hey, these are all the companies gathering data about you, what are you gonna do about it, Kate? I'm like, what am I gonna do about it? I mean, I'm one individual against enormous power structures, both public and private. So I'm really just basically saying I'm, I'm delighted to hear so many people move beyond this, this very individualistic framing of, of privacy, and, and hopefully we can get to these broader questions of ethics and agency, and I think we'll, we'll you know, definitely be focusing on that in the panel at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to pick up on some threads about data literacy because I think this is maybe one of the most foundationally important pieces. Um, but I, I maybe want to also branch that with something which I would broadly, more broadly call data understanding. The, if we think about literacy, I think we're forced into a pedagogical framework of like how can we teach people about these, these things that our data scientists over there are doing and, and um, the type of technology that's behind it. I'm an artist and, and I also think about how, uh, what kind of role arts and culture can play to, to build in a more systemic understanding of these issues in, into our culture and, and what happens when we start to engage with, with novelists and poets and, and, and dancers and so on who can bring these issues into the public in a way which isn't overtly pedagogical so that people aren't feeling like they're in school but instead are feeling about that they're learning about these complex issues in slightly m maybe more engaging ways. And I think one of the things that the arts does very well is to engage with ambiguity and I think a lot of these discussions that we're talking about are rife with ambiguity. And, and, and perhaps the arts can offer us uh, uh, an angle to be able to embrace that in, in a way that is um, maybe slightly less um, 
direct than the types of conversations that we're having right now. Um, one thing that has been in the conversation, but I don't think we're drawing very much attention to, and I notice it because I find it completely mysterious, and people in this room are the ones who should be understanding lots of the dimensions of this. It's come up in a lot of places, but we talk about data gatherers and data subjects, but there's this whole layer of third-party data brokers that are moving this data between institutions, aggregating them, selling them, right? And we saw it sort of a, in, in the healthcare one, like, look at who's looking up this data, look at who's, and yet we sort of leave that. And I find it really mysterious that I don't know much about the character of that industry. I don't know much about the distinctions between companies that are scraping data they can find publicly, companies that are buying up data that they can get privately, companies that are combining data. Um, and, and to me, I mean, part of what we could do is, as academics, we could sort of explain this industry, highlight it. I think one of the things that's really powerful about it is that it, it, it isn't anywhere near the consumer. It isn't anywhere near the market in, in the, from the buyer's sense uh, point of view. So it's very hard to see those elements and to know what their role is. And, and the reason why I think it matters is that for me, the, the policy question it isn't, to me, it's not the um, how are we sort of managing individual transactions and making sure that they work. It's um, we're, we're looking for places where we can intervene such that inequities can be addressed. And it, it's not that inequities get solved, unfortunately, but we create apparatus for them to be addressed when they happen. So at the very least, my interaction with Verizon has a dynamic. And if I, you know there are class action suits and there are consumer rights, there are ways to address that. My interaction with the federal government, there are ways to at least raise questions about that. But I am nowhere near a third party data broker who is nevertheless extracting value out of my data, but in a way where I had no idea they got it, I had no idea where they took it, I had no idea where, uh, what value they got. And that's a piece of this puzzle. We've mentioned it four or five times. It's, I think it's at the heart of what Clay was asking this morning about you know, HIPAA deals with institutions, what the hospital has to do, what the record keeper has to do. But who are these other stakeholders? And, and because they're far away from both institutional requirements, like if you are a health organization, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and far enough from the person that they, the, the movements they're making, the innovations that they're making, I think are the hardest for us to grasp. But they're, they seem to be a part of this picture. So um, I have a, a couple of quick observations. We have, there are things Dana asked us about, uh, whether it's been mentioned or not. And, and one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the global context for this in, in a substantive way. And I think of that in, in really in two ways. Um, one way is that it's not just simply the flattening <coughs> of the, the planet, but the way that innovation is being used as an engine not only of, of economic development, but of, of social change. Right, so we're not just thinking about innovation in building cell towers because it's easy to jump over landlines in, in East Africa where um, I spend a, a reasonable amount of my time running a, a program in, in Kenya. Um, it's about how to rethink the way that structures of, of democratic deliberation work in countries that have historically not had that, that same kind of opportunity. So you think about a country like, um, like Kenya that has 42 tribes and 70 different um, dialects uh, for which there is no word in Swahili for the future and you sort of think how do you have a conversation about risk when there isn't a word for the future and then you realize that in kind of the uh, the Ubuntu tradition the the concept is I am because we are so personal identity is not just this concept of a community but the very notion of identity is based on something completely separate from um, your zip code and the SNP profile in, in your genome. And I, I mention this first point because I think some of what we're about here captured brilliantly, I have to say, Dana, under those three little words, social, cultural, and ethical, um, is that there's a lot more that each of them has to offer <coughs> us than I think we've even been able to uh, scratch the surface. I, I rather agree um, with the, I don't know how many right honorables you're allowed to have. I'm, I'm Canadian, and if there are any other members of the Commonwealth who like right honorables, by all means, uh, you know, put your hand up. But I'm rather taken with the, the cautious reminder about going down the wrong rabbit hole. Um, I think it is not only the wrong rabbit hole, that hole was filled in a long time ago. Sub uh, holes were built and other uh, you know, other little uh, areas and uh, tunnels have been built away from it. In fact, I think it's like the magician. Everyone says, look at the privacy issue. That's the real issue when, in fact, 
what's going on are, are issues of, of foreign policy, economic development, food security. I mean, the list that we all know about, which is why it's such a cool, cool group here. So summary point number one is we really do need to think about what this means uh, from the, I want to say the global perspective, but that sounds too much like the cosmic perspective. And I personally like how Neil deGrasse Tyson did the Cosmos episode uh, last week. Second point about, about international, and it's been mentioned several times, so I only add my, my hat to the, the coat rack, and that is this really has nothing to do with data and everything to do with power and politics. Data is just the, the delivery vehicle for having the conversation about who owns what and who gets to decide and who gets to decide who gets to decide. You know, those of us 10, 15 years ago who played around on the Genome Project and looked at all the ethical, legal, and social issues, uh, we talked about these fairly, you know, fairly intensely, spent about $80 million to, un to map and sequence the privacy gene, if I could use that uh, phrase. We kind of figured it out. Uh, we figured out there are empirical issues, there are policy issues, there are social attitudes. Got it. Now what are we going to do to redesign systems that can accommodate different preferences, different social realities, and, and what I think we've also glossed over, but everybody doesn't need reminding, uh, that there isn't a simple explanation for what constitutes the, the set of communities that we want to, we are, we are all intimately part of many communities. So this is, as has been said probably uh, you know, by others, this is a real wicked problem. I mean, it's, it's the definition of a wicked problem, right? because all of us are coming at it from our own disciplinary perspectives. I'm trained in philosophy and bioethics. Is there another one of you in here? I think there are a couple. There are two librarians. We know that. Um, the genome of this room has been carefully orchestrated by Dana and her, her genetic engineers. We're here for a reason, and there, she's already said there are people who aren't here. So I just, I, I want us to remind ourselves about what these dimensions are from both a, a global and a, and a political perspective. So um, I'm one of these pesky data scientists. Um, and to make things work uh, worse, I work in digital advertising. You can beat me up in a dark alley later. Um, but as such, I'm trained to think about problems and solutions. And um, when I'm, when I'm looking at this, I really loved Clay's perspective on saying it's the uh, disappearance of inconvenience. But when I hear the proposed solutions like transparency or data literacy or any of, the, uh, of that, I feel like we're facing off, I mean, it's not even Goliath we're talking about here. You're saying that I, with all the inconvenience of my very limited brain power, am up to assess and judge the data that are of mine used somewhere in this completely easy environment of big computing where people can do almost anything. So my somewhat um, limited uh, perspective here is I spent 20 years learning about data and algorithms. I cannot control them. Nobody understands them. It actually doesn't matter what the algorithm does. There are so many, they kind of all do the same at the end of the day. I don't understand the data I'm dealing with. I mean, let alone, and I, sp I mean, I spend eight hours a day doing, doing this, right? Now in my free time, I'm supposed to figure out what Facebook is doing with the data they collect, but I have no idea what's going on. So I'm just in terms of problems and solutions. I'm hesitant to embrace um, transparency or literacy as really being effective at that. I don't think you can really govern or control data. I don't think governing algorithms is very effective either. The only two places I see is you can probably work on the decisions that are being done with it. That's the one part where actually somebody decides that there's a human somewhere there, and that's the place where you can get back to that. Or you can at the very beginning says you just can't record, it's all illegal. Um, that's the only al other alternative I see. Uh, we tend to take for granted that technology is a cause of problems in this area. But I want to suggest that there are also advanced technological methods that we can use to foster fairness and transparency and accountability. Uh, they're not always uh, obvious if you don't look carefully. Um, 
but, um, but I don't think we should uh, take the attitude that uh, we're fighting against technology here. Uh, we should think about opening up a technological front on some of these problems and figure out how we can use these technical methods to make the algorithms more accountable, fair, and transparent as they operate as part of a strategy for dealing with this. Um, so I would urge folks to spend more time talking about that. And uh, we can even get started by looking at specific problems and specific fairness or transparency goals that we'd like to uh, provide. And we can talk about real solutions. OK, I would like to bring forth the people who make big data happen, so the engineers who might have solutions. And I've been working with engineers in computer science research and looking at their conception of privacy and society. And these are very different sometimes, so we need to also think about that. But also, if we think of, for example, Facebook, it does allow its users to report back when they have ethical, social, or cultural concerns through the reporting button. And if you do the go through the reporting button today, since it's a very expensive thing to have human interfaces to big data problems, you'll first run into an algorithm, which decide, which is a decision tree, which you have to successfully go through. Um, and if you finally go through it, then there's a, a telecenter worker, probably in Morocco somewhere, who's paid $1 a day, who gets to look at your ethical concern and makes a very reasonable decision. Um, and so I would love to have not just a data-centric view of all of this um, big data, but also think about what does it mean to run data centers, what does it mean to be an engineer and to come up with um, ethical solutions, um, and what does it mean to labor with big data. Thank you. So. Um, Building on some of the comments made about once you open up the data, how is it interpreted and how that can be really problematic. It's really hard to guide interpretation or build capability to interpret data. So I'm wondering, uh, and to Jake's earlier point, is there some work we can do about assessing the quality of a data set? Uh, so sort of like the scientific peer review process before academic articles uh, get into the literature. What I'm, what I'm really worried about is if we open up data sets, would we see something like the, what I'll call the YouTube effect, which is where the, po the most popular videos become the most influential, even if they're not necessarily the best. So the, are, the, are really the most popular videos, is that the best music coming out? We can debate about that. But, um, and I think that there are two big concerns that I see about about uh, making sure a data set is, is high quality. I think with big data, we can run into precision masquerading as accuracy. So because you can put a lot of, of uh, you know, d a, a lot of zeros after your decimal point, that more precise data looks like it's more accurate, even though it's not necessarily. And, and another one is, is thinking about who is this data ac actually representative of what population can we extrapolate to? And I think there's, um, there's an idea that this data, that this big data that we're collecting is representative of, of large groups, wh which is not really the case. And so if we can get some parameters around the data that we collect that look at how actually representative is this and how accurate is this data, maybe that would help to guide interpretation. I'd just like to add that I'd I think it's important to consider the kinds of problems that big data invite us to solve. Uh, so the existence of data encourages us to see in the data the possibility of solving a particular problem. And in some ways, the mere existence of data already then forecloses other ways of potentially solving problems that are not easy to solve because they don't have data to solve them with. Um, so my suggestion then is that it would make sense to broaden the conversation about these ethical and policy concerns to ones that basically ask, is the ease with which we can solve certain kinds of problems with data t uh, you know, pushing us towards particular kinds of solutions that have their own problems that can be compared to many other different ways of solving problems that might be much more costly, uh, but might not suffer all these kinds of problems or, or introduce all these kinds of ethical dilemmas that we have with others. Thank you guys all for an amazingly productive uh, set of questions, provocations, engagements today. Um, we're now in a position where we're going to switch into um, the final the workshops, which are sort of the more intensive moments where you can actually work and collaborate in groups. 
Um, these workshops are very much designed to give you a space to really brainstorm with each other, to really critique, to interrogate. Um, as was mentioned before, there was some social engineering involved in setting up these teams so that hopefully you'll actually see some really diverse perspectives um, as a place to talk with one another and to really engage across sectors and experiences. Um, the goal with these workshops is to allow you to do these deep dives. Um, as part of this, there will be uh, two facilitators uh, from different perspectives who will help try to guide the conversation and make certain that it's flowing. I get the sense that get, getting things flowing around this crowd is not going to be very hard, which is great. Um, there is also uh, a set of rapporteurs who will be actually taking notes and trying to capture material. Um, but they'll also be there sort of asking or to answer questions or whatnot. Um, I want to identify and thank them just so you can see them because they actually know where you're going, which is going to be really important. Um, would the rapporteur's mind standing up um, and just saying, say, say your name and say which uh, session you're leading so that people can know who to follow. Hi, I'm We're all going to Furman. We're all going next door. Okay. Heather. So the thing is, before we would transition, because we're not actually going to get back together, I want to sort of take a moment to actually say some thank yous. First, a huge thank you to Nicole Wong for giving us this opportunity to bring all of us together, which is just absolutely wonderful. Um, so grateful for so grateful for this chance. I also want to say a huge thank you to the team at Data and Society, in particular, Ellen Menlo, who has just been a lifesaver in getting these things together. Seth Young, Seth Young, who had to unfortunately leave us, but has been a fabulous uh, uh, character in getting the back end going. Mark Forsher, who has been great at actually uh, putting together all of our online materials, making all of that happen. Um, Alex Rosenblatt and uh, Tamara uh, Nice, who have been fantastic at building up those documents that you have seen. Um, and Sarah Smith, who has been out there sort of building out a whole team of great people to really help us. Um, we're also so grateful to the folks at NYU, and particularly the Information Law Institute, for their amazing support in making this happen, being here, um, and uh, working you know, with a bunch of their fellows to actually make a lot of this happen. Um, the amazing rapporteurs that, that you just saw have just been phenomenal at pulling some of this stuff together. Um, and also grateful, grateful to all the folks at NYU, the catering team, the AV team, to really make this be real. I also sort of don't want to fail to acknowledge the phenomenal um, support and help um, from the different sponsors of this event, who, um, much to my surprise, were all willing to jump in very, very last minute uh, for an event that you know had a very short window. Um, and in particular, the um, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Microsoft Research, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, all of whom just sort of said, yes, we will help you. Let's make it happen, which I have to say, you know, having done grants before, this was completely shocking at how wonderful and how quick everything moved. I was like, wow. Um, so I just want to say super huge thanks to everybody for sort of jumping in. Um, at 5 o'clock, uh, the, the workshops will end, um, and you will be given sort of a 10-minute warning before they are to do that. What happens at 5 o'clock is that we're going to be ushered back into this building, across from where you had lunch, um, into a place called Tishman Auditorium. Tishman is where we're going to be at a big public event. There are going to be 450 people. It will be packed house. So we will be working on getting people in as fast as possible. All of you will have seats that are saved up front so that you know as you're transitioning from the workshops, it's all very viable. Um, but please you know, take your bathroom breaks and sort of move over. And please don't hang out in the lobby so you can make it easier for us to actually transition to the seats. Um, 
And more than it, and the other thing is say after Tishman, there will be a reception. All of you are invited. Um, I know many of you uh, are coming tonight, which will be a great opportunity then to just hang out. But above all, thank you so much for coming and being here and engaging on such critical issues in such a short window of time. I'm super grateful. It has been absolutely phenomenal. So thank you. Thank you.